All right, if everyone again, could please take your seats and get ready and get started. <clears throat> Our growing resistance. We have a panel full of contract, contract growers. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, can everyone hear me? So my name is Steve Etka. I'm with the Campaign for Contract Agriculture Reform, and I'll talk a little bit about what CCAR is in a bit, and I'm going to introduce my colleagues in a bit. But before we get there, I wanted to thank uh, the Food Integrity Campaign and GAP for pulling this conference together and for pulling all of us together. I um, also wanted to thank you all for this uh, setup, because I hate standing behind a podium sometimes, and uh, I kind of like the Oprah setup here. We'll uh, try to make sure it's more Oprah and less Jerry Springer, but we'll see how that goes. Um, one of the things I wanted to do before we get started is just to have a better sense of, of who's in the audience. Um, so uh, if you're a law student, could you raise your hand? Great. If you are an attorney now, raise your hand. And if you are an academic, raise your hand. Uh, if you are a vegan or vegetarian, raise your hand. And if you are a flexitarian, raise your hand. And if you are a farmer, raise your hand. And maybe the most important question, if you in your personal life and or work life work to uh, draw attention to the abuses of the industrialized food system, raise your hand. Good, that worked. I was <laughs> um, when I was listening to the, the, the talk throughout the day, uh, I was thinking about some of the things that folks were saying, of course, and uh, Jim Keenan is keynote uh, the beginning of his keynote made the point that I feel like I'm, I'm here with my tribe. And uh, I've been thinking about that throughout the day because it's, it's, I think a lot of us feel that way, but it's kind of remarkable in the sense that uh, we all really come from very different perspectives. And um, I think Erica made the point that our strength is, is in our differences, uh, in that the unity that comes from our different perspectives actually makes us stronger, which I think is a really important point because we're all here talking about the abuses uh, and the injustices of the industrialized food system, injustices to the environment, to farm workers, to the animals, um, and we're here to talk a bit about the farmer perspective on that. Um, often when you hear these conversations, particularly outside of this room, uh, a lot of times it turns into a conversation about how the farmer is, is the bad guy. So I really wanted to thank Amanda and Gap for uh, their work and working on behalf of farmers who are in this system and uh, for recognizing that the farmers in many cases are also the victims of this system. Uh, GAP actually is the newest member of the coalition that I represent, which is the Campaign for Contract Agriculture Reform. And CCAR was started way back in 1999 um, and it's really a coalition of organizations with a shared concern about the effects and trends of vertical integration in agriculture. We tend to talk about poultry the most because it's the cautionary tale. It's the one that's been vertically integrated the longest. But there's certainly other examples of that. Hogs are, are very contracted these days. So I'm very honored to be with all of these gentlemen in the long list of farmers and farmer advocates uh, throughout the years that I've been working on this since 1999, who, in my mind, have been very brave about um, standing up and talking about these abuses and, and what actually goes on in the, the contract ag system. So with that, I wanted to introduce my colleagues here. Um, first, we have Rudy Howell, who is a retired industrial mechanic for DuPont and has been a Purdue contract farmer for 25 years. 
uh, after years of enduring unfair business practices, he has decided to speak out against the contract growing system, and Rudy has gathered more than 100,000 signatures, urging Congress to protect honest chicken growers who raised concerns. And his, um, he's an advocate for farmers who wish to improve the system. I will note that Rudy is a current poultry grower, which we'll get back to that theme because a lot of times it's the former growers who are in a better position to speak out um, because of the retaliation concerns. Uh, next, we have Carlton Sanders, who began raising chickens in 1991 for Cook Foods. Uh, our Cook Foods took over his contract in 2001, and he became the only black farmer out of 173 farmers contracting with that company in Mississippi. When he spoke out about discrimination at the company, they retaliated against him, and the bank foreclosed on his farm in 2017, and he filed for bankruptcy. He lost his family and his health due to the stress, and ProPublica recently featured his experience in an investigative report last June. And next we have Mike Weaver, uh, also a former contract poultry grower. Mike uh, is a former grower from West Virginia who was raised, um, who did raise birds for Pilgrim's Pride for 16 years. Uh, and he's been speaking out against the injustices of the industry and the need for reform since 2010. And despite suffering retaliation, he continues to speak out and is connected uh, with uh, the Food Integrity Campaign to prevent further reprisal. Uh, in 2019, he began a process of renovating his poultry barns into buildings for raising and processing hemp. And we'll talk about that more to the end of the at the end of this session. And last but certainly not least is Tyler Whitley from the Rural Advancement Foundation International. And I should say, when I first started this work, it was Rafi that contacted me to, to start in this effort. Um, Tyler's organization based in North Carolina. And Tyler is one of a, a long list of incredible advocates that that organization has, has uh, hired to work on these issues. So Tyler is a contract agriculture reform program manager at RAFI, and he advocates for contract livestock farmers using his background in finance, organizing, and uh, livelihoods. And uh, he supports farmers by providing information and resources, organizing workshops, and leading in-house research. And he has worked for large NGOs in Cambodia, faith-based based projects in Haiti, and farming education programs in rural America. And he holds a BS in biology from University of Alabama and a MPH from Tulane. Um, I wanted to actually maybe start with Tyler. Uh, Tyler, could you spend a few minutes uh, explaining the basics of how the contract poultry system works and why contract growers are so vulnerable to retaliation under that system? Uh, sure. Thank you, Steve. Um, for those in the audience who may not, you know, um, have fully understood the system, you know, Steve mentioned vertical integration before, and so a lot of people in America um, believe that it's poultry, um, that uh, chickens that the individual farmer owns, but over the last 70 years, um, our system of um, poultry production has move to one where the entire company owns the value chain. So they own the hatchery that hatches the chicken, they own the chicken itself, they own the feed chain, uh, sorry, the feed mills that produce the feed, they own the trucks that bring the feed. Um, they may contract those out in some instances, but by and large they own those. They own the processing facilities, they own the packaging facilities, they own the further processing facilities that turn um, cuts of meat into chicken strips or chicken nuggets, things of that nature. And by and large, when you go into a grocery store and you may see an entire shelf full of different brands of poultry products, they come from a very, very small group of companies that produce those. If you go to a restaurant that serves chicken, likely they're going to come from that same very small um, group of companies. And so what happens is this is that they contract with individual farmers to build poultry facilities um, these houses that 
maybe 50 by 500 square feet, and the farmer owns um, the facility, the debt associated with the facility, and the liability for removal and disposal of the uh, chicken carcasses as well as the waste. So essentially everything that creates value and profit, the company will own, and everything that creates debt and liability, the farmer will own. And they're paid on a per pound basis. So if they're delivered, you know, three day old chicks and they raise them to 35, 60 days, whatever, all the weight that is put on them during that time, they're paid by the pound. Uh, the average compensation right now is around a nickel, nickel and a half nationally, I'd say, um, per pound. Um, but um, part the another wrinkle that comes in is an incentive mechanism to ensure that the poultry farmers, you know, put forward all their effort in maintaining the health of these birds, and that's called the tournament system. And so they'll take the growers who finish in the same week and, you know, drop off their chickens, and they'll rank them top to bottom on efficiency. So, you know, that's how well the chickens that you were delivered, um, how well they performed with the feed that was delivered again by the company. And they determine a median for the week, you know, middle ground. Above that, you receive a bonus. Below that, you receive a deduction. And that deduction from your pay, um, sorry, the bonus from the pay comes from those who finish below. So you may be averaging five cents a pound, but for that particular week, you may actually work out to earn four cents a pound, whereas someone else owns six cents. And by and large, this is not fully explained or um, elaborated to the growers who are getting into this system. They're giving average numbers for average earnings, average costs, everything on an average. And they say that it works out on an average. But we all know that nothing is the same from one to the next. Two dogs aren't the same. Two people aren't the same. Two kernels of corn are not the same. They're not going to have the same nutritional content. They're not going to perform the same. And so what ends up happening is that the farmers are paying the price for corporate efficiency. And so they pass on inefficiencies to the system, to the farmers. And where this works out is that because everything is owned by the company, provided by the company, it allows for a lot of manipulation of inputs at a local level. And so, um, you know, I think that the best way to see how that plays out is maybe to hear from someone like Mike, who, you know, um, in addition to being a former poultry grower, is also the president of the Contract Poultry Growers Association of the Virginias, representing both Virginia and West Virginia. Um, and he's not only experienced, but heard hundreds of stories of how this retaliation has played out to a farmer and it could be something very small that results in tens of thousands of dollars. So, Mike, would you mind speaking on that, sir? No. Uh, I don't know where to start, to be honest with you. There's so many instances where these atrocities have been imposed upon contract poultry farmers that it's shameful and it should be illegal. And, and we've made efforts <clears throat> through Congress many times uh, trying to to get uh, Congress to uh, and USDA to pass and implement uh, changes to the regulations that would take these atrocities that, that uh, Tyler explained a little bit uh, out of the hands of the, the poultry companies. Uh, right now, the, the contracts are terribly abusive and they're take it or leave it. So even, even though you may have one and a half million dollars invested in an operation to raise their chickens for them, if you do something they don't like, they might might tell you, uh, we're not going to bring you chickens tomorrow. And there's nothing you can do about it under the contract. So here you are with one and a half million dollars in debt for a facility to raise their chickens. It's pretty much a dedicated facility. Uh, and if they don't bring you chickens, you're going to lose your home and your farm. And they know that. And they abuse that terribly. Shamefully. Um, the tournament system Tyler was just speaking about. Um, every week, uh, every farmer whose chickens get processed for that week is forced to get, all those farmers are forced to compete against each other for their pay. And Tyler described it, but uh, whoever the average farmer is gets the, gets the pay, the average pay that's in the contract. 
But if any, anybody whose uh, weight of birds is less than his, or they, it took more feed to produce that chicken uh, than, the, than the, the average farmer, gets money taken out of their pay. And when you folks go to the grocery store and you, sp you pay 2 or $3 a pound for chicken, the farmer who spent at least six weeks raising that chicken gets five cents of that. I grew chickens for, all, for, I started out with turkeys for three years and then I went to chickens, I did chickens for 15 years, I never had an increase in pay. And just to, to show you how much kind of, what kind of money there is in the poultry industry, in 2015 and 16, Pilgrim's Pride, who I raised chickens for, paid their stockholders $1.2 billion in dividends. And it had been almost 20 years since their growers had had an increase in pay. And that's how badly they abuse farmers. We, the Obama administration proposed some, some uh, sweeping regulation changes in uh, 2010. We had tremendous hope for that. Uh, we were made a lot of promises. Uh, they held some workshops around the country, uh, one on poultry, one on beef, one on dairy, one on grain, and the last one was on the farmer's share of the, of the food dollar. Uh, the, the, what we referred to as the GYPSA rules were proposed at the time. They would have taken away this tournament system that they pay us under. They would have made the contracts more fair. Uh, right now the contracts are take it or leave it. Um, there, there were really good changes that we hoped would, would be implemented. Uh, we were made a lot of promises. None of it ever materialized. Um, two, two regulations that, that were not completely done away with before the Obama administration left. Actually, they, they threw two changes out there at, right before they left office that would have made a little bit of a uh, difference for us. Um, immediately as the new administration took office, which they all do, uh, they, they froze those. Uh, one of those has been completely done away with since, and one is still pending that we're, we're hoping something comes out of it. And uh, it, it's an undue preference uh, regulation that says you can't treat the next farmer better than you treat all the farmers. Uh, that remains to be seen whether that's going to amount to anything or not, but we spent some time on Capitol Hill lobbying for that and, and trying to promote that too, and uh, even visited with the Office of Management and Budget about it to try to make sure that it, it's something that comes out that's good for family farmers and not for the for big ag. And that, you know, that's that's a whole different issue. Big big ag to me, and I could stand up here and preach to you guys for two hours about that because you young people in here especially should be tremendously concerned about how much control big agriculture has over what you eat. If you all don't help us change this, change the situation the way it is and put the, the uh, raising of your food back in the hands of family farmers, your kids will never see food raised by a family farmer. And before I forget, in case I don't get another opportunity, I want to thank every one of you, you young folks and, and everybody that's in here for being here today. Most farmers have no idea that you folks are out there advocating for them and doing the things that you do. Thank you. We appreciate you. I don't know if I answered your question or not. but I think that was great, Mike. Um, I, I think that was great. Before we go on, I just want to try to bring up some of the, like, small um, minutiae that affect the farmer. So you may get birds delivered to your farm that have diseases and your hacks to raise them. All the management practices that these farmers have to adhere to, those come from the company. So, you know, someone might tell you a story about um, having to call out small birds, perfectly healthy, but they're killed and that's not their choice, that's management's choice. And like Mike said, you either do it or you lose your contract. Right now, um, I don't know if you know Lincoln Premium Poultry, but you probably know Costco. Their building facilities in Nebraska. The average cost of those facilities for four houses is $1.76 million. And that doesn't include all the equipment necessary to operate that facility. So you might as well call it $2 million. So, you know, a chicken, uh, a chicken grower may be held out of feed you know, one called me yesterday, literally on the drive up here. He was held out of feed for 28 hours. So that's a 
that's a chicken that is less than 15 days old that has not had any feed for 28 hours. And in his case, it was actually 32,000 chickens per house times four. So you're looking at, what, 120 some odd thousand chickens without feed for 28 hours. And this is not his choice. What ended up happening is what Mike talked about. Large agribusiness corporations over the last 70 years have decided to go out and pursue profit at any cost necessary at every aspect of the food system. And so now they have such amount of control that they can do virtually anything that they want with regards to this type of system. So sorry about that. But yeah. Thanks, Tyler and Mike. I, one of the things that I'm remembering right now is uh, that there was an organization that is no longer in existence uh, called the Delmarva Poultry Justice Alliance, and it was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And as many of you all may know, the Delmarva Peninsula, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, is um, a big poultry production area. And this organization that was a member of CCAR uh, at that time uh, was actually funded by, uh, initially by the uh, Episcopal Diocese of Delaware because there was a recognition on the part of the faith-based community there of how abusive this model was and how it was affecting the entire community, uh, so many of the communities throughout the eastern shore of Delmarva. Um, and one of the things they did a really good job of doing is, is showing how much of a strategy it was on the part of poultry companies to divide the different demographics of folks involved in the system. So they were pointing out that, uh, that the poultry growers were almost entirely white people, uh, that the catchers, who are the folks that the, they're uh, employed by the poultry companies to go into the poultry growers' houses and catch the chickens to take them to the processing plant, were at that time almost entirely African American. And the plant workers were almost entirely uh, uh, Latino and non-English speaking. And so even by that structure, there was this effort to divide those folks, all who were kind of suffering under the model created by the poultry companies, so that they didn't communicate. So this Delmarva Poultry Justice Alliance uh, really worked to bring all of those folks together and get them to recognize that they all were just kind of suffering from different subsets of the structure. Um, Tyler, you've already mentioned that, uh, and Mike too, that growers are very vulnerable if they speak out publicly uh, about the system or join together in producer associations to try to negotiate better terms uh, with the poultry companies that control their contracts and their livelihoods. Um, so Tyler, in your work with Rafi and the work that Rafi's done over the last 25, 30 years on this, uh, I realize some of that was before your time, but um, uh, I know you've seen these abuses firsthand, uh, but I want you to talk about your work with, uh, with communities of color and how the basic abuses that poultry growers face are exacerbated when they're overlaid with um, racial discrimination and what your work has been on that. Uh, sure. Um, so earlier I mentioned how uh, the companies will come to growers with false promises. They're telling you averages, they're omitting a lot of information, that sort of thing. Um, most farmers bite on the offer because the economic reality in production ag right now is such that it's a very bleak system. We have a, um, more farm bankruptcies than we've had since the 80s, farmer suicides on the rise. So um, farmers don't have a lot of options, and so they'll get into um, poultry farming as a way to bring, guarantee, quote, guaranteed income to the farm. So over the last 30-some-odd years, you've had an influx of immigrants from um, Southeast Asian countries or You've had African Americans who've been able to access um, sufficient land to access the capital necessary to build these facilities. 
And so, um, you know, a lot of these people, it's very culturally important to farm. And so they've looked at it as another way of providing guaranteed income to their farm. And so I think of like uh, the Hmong community, Hmong people are a uh, ethnic minority from Laos. Many of them immigrated to America after the Vietnam War with the secret war in Laos. Um, many of them relocated to Arkansas of all places because that's actually where some of the CIA operatives themselves decided to retire to. So it's pretty interesting history there. But um, they got involved in poultry farming because they wanted to farm poultry. And um, farming for them is extremely culturally important. Um, when I worked in Cambodia with FAO, it was along the Cambodian Thai Lao border where the three countries meet. And so this is something that's extremely important to them. It's an idealistic, you know, pastoral image of life. And so they return to that. And so what you have is you have instances where individual discrimination happens. Think a person using racial slurs, talking to a person in a um, very disrespectful manner, treating them very poorly, uh, not calling in a feed order, things of that nature. But also uh, higher level management will often gloss over information or maybe there's something that the individual immigrant farmer is not uh, very comfortable with and they would like to bring a you know family member with them to a meeting so that someone can take notes or help them to go through legal documents, things of that nature, and they're not given that ability. It's like, uh, no, we only deal with you. You can't bring a family member. You can't bring someone outside. Um, very much um, uh, similar to what you'll see in some other, you know, um, ag worker spaces. There's been stories of biosecurity used as a mask to keep people from organizing. And so for the Hmong people, they, um, they've talked about stories of not being able to gather on each other's farms to practice some of their religious traditions under the guise of biosecurity. You can't have too many growers um, congregating in an area because then you could spread disease, you know, something like that. Um, and I get a lot of calls from farmers from, you know, Delaware to Arkansas and Indiana to Georgia. I talk to a lot of poultry farmers. And so Carlton was actually one farmer who reached out to us because he is from Forest, Mississippi, um, you know, outside of Jackson. And he dealt with um, discrimination in his particular instance that led to him losing his farm but it was a long track of discrimination that led to that. And so, Carlton, would you mind sharing a little bit of your story and what you went through and what happened, sir? For my being here, and I thank God for all of you. And it's an honor as well as a privilege to be here to represent. And uh, I grew chicken for cooked food for 28 years. Uh, prior to that, I worked as a uh, crane operator by building cranes in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was treated equally and fairly. And uh, no matter what happened, I, they listened to me and I was heard. There was no such thing as a black guy or white guy. And I, I had grown accustomed to that. And I came back to Mississippi and uh, it was hard for me to, uh, I had to go back to the bottom of the Lying again on the bottom of the bus, back of the bus. Uh, but that's why I first I was with BC Rogers, a family owned operated company, uh, a good company. They, uh, they listened to me and uh, uh, let me hit, uh, voice my opinion about things. Uh, and I did. And I liked growing chicken for them. Uh, I just, in fact, I loved it. And they were professional, they were honest. And they shared, and they wanted me to share. If I didn't like a service man and we wasn't getting along, they would tell me, let us know, and we'll move him and get you someone else. So after they uh, uh, got in trouble and filed bankruptcy, uh, cooked food, bought them out, and uh, they were just like going to hell when that happened. Uh, there was no, they just say jumping, and uh, you just say, hi, hi, you want me to jump? And from there, it just went south. Uh, you couldn't say nothing. They didn't have any blacks in the office, no black servicemen, nobody black nowhere. Uh, they just hate black folks. And, uh, you know, I went along with that, went along with that, and eventually 
They told me, said, uh, if you want to do really good, which I was the top girl, I was in the top five all the time, if not number one. And uh, they told me, said, uh, if you really want to do good, so buy these guys a four-wheeler uh, or side by side. I said myself, I said, I'm not going to do that just to get along with these guys. Uh, that's not fair. So the white guys were doing it, and they were sitting up there, and they would say, man, won't you do it? And I said, oh, I can't do that. So just went from bad to worse. Uh, like I said, uh, they kept giving me upgrades to do, and the first one, the bank went along with it, and we did it. Uh, the first one was 130000 And the bank told me after that, said, I'm, we're not going to keep going up because I had them paid out for one year, and I had everything paid from 750000 down to uh, less than a hundred, and so they found out somehow, and then they started upgrading, upgrading, upgrading. So, like I said, the first upgrade was uh, 130, and after that, the next year they said they would never do it again, and the next year they came back with 250,000. And so the bank told me, says, uh, they called me in and they said, uh, we're not going to do it. I like working with you. Uh, you're a good grower, uh, one of the best we ever had, and. Uh, but we want to get this thing paid out eventually. We're not just going to keep going, going, and going, and going. So uh, a couple of months later, they called me and they told me, said, uh, I want you to come in and uh, we're going to give you a house on an acre of land, worst case scenario. I said, well, no problem. I said, well, how about two acres of land? And they said, we can make it happen. So kept rolling and rolling and rolling, and uh, still no chicken, no chicken. And that went on for about a year. So the bank called me back in and they said, uh, we changed our minds, so you must be out of your mind to think that we were going to give you that house on acre land. Um, I said, well, that's what you said. I got a witness. He said, don't pay it on his mind. That's, that's over with. So I filed bankruptcy trying to save everything. And uh, on a Friday, the judge was on my side. He said, y'all had an attorney, the best in the, in the whole world. And uh, I got to pay him $5,000 just to take my case. And uh, he said, I haven't lost a case. So messed around there, and uh, the other on a Friday, and um, he told me, he said, uh, the judge said, y'all set a price, get together and set a price that Mr. Sanders can pay. And on a Monday, we had court again. Uh, they said $4,000 per month. I said, man, I said, you out of your mind? I said, the dope dealer don't pay you that much money. And so uh, rocked on and rocked on. They said, well, we through. And I said, good God, I lost all that money. And I said, I'm not going to do nothing else. So I uh, rocked on and rocked on, and I lost everything I had. My health, and the reason why my health uh, lost that, because uh, wearing, I didn't want to lose my home for uh, all those years. And, you know, I had everything almost paid for. So uh, once they sold, uh, they almost sold to me and my son. So I have a son. And... Uh, they had it online for $130,000, so my son offered one hundred and fifty, dollars And uh, they wouldn't take the money, and I said, something is wrong. And uh, waited two weeks, so I told my son to call his banker and to see if his banker uh, had heard anything. So he called him, and they said, uh, nope, we want the full price. And um, I went to the courthouse the other day, and I... Uh, find out who bought my place and everything. So I called the guy and I told him, I said, I got to go come down and get my disc and some other things I have to get. And uh, I said, who, what's your name anyway? He said, uh, I'm Mike Freeney. And uh, I said, are you related to Jer uh, Shirley and Joey Freeney? He said, they are my first cousins. And so I called an uh, invest investigative attorney, uh, uh, Wayne Bassett out of Atlanta, Georgia, who worked with the USDA Packers and Stockyard. So Wayne told me it's against the law to sell to, uh, you know, someone out of the office to buy your farm. And I said, well, that's what they did. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm sure I got, he said, well, send me a copy of that. So I sent it to him. So the DOJ has that. And prior to that, uh, you know, there were three other black guys growing chicken for them. And, and pr prior to me, they cut those guys off, and I was the only black guy they had. And they were still getting that federal money uh, saying they had black and it was integrated and, you know, they, they're in trouble for that. So right now I have an attorney. I'm suing and uh, I made the front page of the Clarion Ledger. Uh, 
Walmart has dropped their contract. Uh, Kroger has dropped their contract. Burger King and I think McDonald's uh, thinking to drop their contract. And I read down the second paragraph and it said, uh, the chickens are piling up in the warehouse. And I said, yeah, now we can see who's laughing. They laughed at me and I said, we can laugh at each other now. <laughs> so the last time I was here, uh, I talked to a senator uh, out of Alabama, uh, all of the senators from Mississippi, uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Cory Book, all those guys, and uh, just went on and on and on. And so each one of those senators called those guys, and they said, yeah, Mr. Sanders made a lot of money, and we paid him well for what he did. But he couldn't stop gambling. He had a gambling problem. And they said that, uh, you know, he, didn't, he mismanaged his money. That's not our problem. We paid him for what he did. And uh, again, it's not our problem. So the senators, uh, they just didn't uh, respond to it. They just said, hey, we did our job. So I called Mr. Bashford and told him about it. And he said, uh, that is so terrible. I said, yes, it is. But anyway, like I said, uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, but again, I, couldn't, I wasn't going to buy those guys four wheelers and uh, side by side just to uh, get another chicken. And I just wasn't going to do that. So. They were just prejudiced, and they didn't like black people, and they still don't. So I call it the dirty South. So that's, that's where we are. You know, just uh, all of these things that has been said, that's true. Uh, there's only one way you can get along with the older you're offering senators nowadays. They're giving a young guy like 25 years old or 20. If you build a chicken house for them, they will give you $90,000, $90,000. But now that's just to get you to fall in love with that thing. And once that first bunch is over with, you got old houses, and they finna start to giving you trouble from that day on. And uh, the ninety thousand dollars engagement, is over, the honeymoon is over with. It's over with. They start treating you just as bad as they do the other guys. So, like I said, I ain't got. I wouldn't have a chicken house if you give it to me. <laughs> and that's just the bottom line. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, Carlton's story has been told in. Uh, two different ProPublica articles now. So um, if anyone wants to know more details there, that uh, those articles do a good job of that. Um, Carlton mentioned, you know, uh, some of our work in trying to advocate on these issues on Capitol Hill. And uh, all of these folks were up here in June of this year doing Hill visits, both with uh, members of Congress from their states, the southeastern states for the most part, but also with some some advocates, uh, Senator Warren, Senator Booker, um, and, and others, uh, Congresswoman Captor of Ohio, who have talked about these issues and uh, kind of understood some of the problems and are working with us to try to address them. One thing that, that I have found interesting is that, it's not obvious to folks sometimes how vulnerable these folks are to retaliation. And I have had experiences where uh, poultry growers have come up and, and met with their members of Congress. Those members of Congress contact the poultry companies to say, hey, what's going on here? And then uh, very quickly, those farmers are called into the office of the poultry companies that control their contracts and therefore their livelihoods, and threatened. And basically, they're telling them, you will not go to Capitol Hill. You will not talk about this stuff. You will not talk to USDA. And you know, some open-ended threats about um, uh, contract cancellation or other things. So that's, it's, it's a real problem. Um, for those of us that have worked in this area, we know that the, the federal statute that's most relevant to this is the Packers and Stockyards Act, which was passed way back in 1921 uh, to uh, prohibit unfair and deceptive trade practices and undue and unreasonable preferences and a whole host of other things. Um, so there's a lot of good provisions in that law, but what we also know is that there, a lot of those terms have, have gone undefined, and as a result, it has, it, it's been a bit of a, a paper tiger. Um, Mike and Tyler mentioned that uh, there is another bite at this apple. We did get some uh, good 
draft regulations through the Obama administration, and those were almost over the finish line when the administration changed and the, the Trump administration clawed those back um, as part of their broader anti-regulatory zeal, but also just in part of doing some favors, we think, to, for some of the poultry companies. But even though they've done that, they are actually have uh, said that they are going to um, move forward with another regulation under this statute, uh, and that is what we call the undue preference rulemaking. So, Tyler, can you talk for a minute about what, what we're hoping to get out of that uh, rulemaking? I, you know, I realize it's an uphill battle in this administration to get a positive regulation out of this, but we've been really advocating for some specific things. And then maybe turn it over to Rudy after that to give some examples of where there are under preferences. Sure. Um, you know, like Steve said, the Packers and Stockyards Act was passed in 1921. At that time, five companies controlled 85% of the beef cattle market. Today, four companies control 80% of the beef cattle market. Um, two of those same four companies control, I think it's 45% of the poultry market. If you throw in another two companies that don't operate in beef, it's closer to 76%. You know, you've got 70% of the hog market controlled by four companies again. So we are continuing to advocate for reforms to the Packers and Stockyards Act because it's as relevant today as it was in 1921. Um, we talk about it as the undue preference rule, but it's actually undue, pre undue or unreasonable preference or undue or unreasonable disadvantage. And so that could work its out, itself out in that you are giving extra feed to one farmer but charging another farmer. Or it could be like an example of bringing, there's different types of feed just like there is for humans. You know, you would not feed a week old baby um, zucchini, you know, um, that would just not work. So in the same way, you don't bring young chicks the same feed that you bring an older chicken that's about to go to processing. And so, but what often happens is if Rudy here voices concern to his local management because they backed a truck into his house and now he has to fix it, which will cost him tens of thousands of dollars and they're not going to give him any compensation, what, they're gonna, what they might do is bring him finishing feed you know, to a brand new chick that that chick can't consume. And so Rudy is actually, because he's still, you know, everyone has seen different ways that undue or unreasonable preference has played out in their career as a farmer. But Rudy has some very interesting ones. He's extremely meticulous in his, you know, documentation. So Rudy, would you mind sharing some of those like actual examples that you currently see, sir? Yeah, I, I feel kind of bad sometimes when I come up here working with Steve and Tyler. Uh, I'm the only one that's really got a contract. The guys come up here every time I come up here. Matter of fact, my wife came with me the last time. She said, Rudy, she said, we don't have the problem. These folks have. But it's because I caught her hand and I try to hold her feet to the fire. Ain't always because they won't allow you. Because I call it corporate socialism. Because they got control over everything. Uh, they don't even honor their own contract. Matter of fact, I never signed their last contract. The last contract had in it that I could not join a class action lawsuit. If I had any complaints against them, I had to drop them. Uh, and uh, I just told them that I wasn't going to sign their contract. They told me, you don't sign this contract, you're not going to get burned. I said, so be it. I went fishing. When I come back, it was on my voice recorder. Uh, Rudy, uh, I haven't got all my advocates together and our lawyers. Uh, uh, we can't get to a meeting or whatever. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and call? My suggestion is you go ahead and call Live Hall, I mean Live Production, and go ahead and put back in. And, uh, you know, as early as next week. Well, I went ahead and screwed around with him. I waited another week just, just to, you know, show him I wasn't bowing down to him. But they don't even honor their own contract. There was a case here about a flock or two ago of some of the new farmers out there. They got six house farms, they got four house farms. All of them are supposed to be settled under that one contract. You know, you got a six house farm, 
a full house farm, two house farm, whatever, whatever the owner has. Right? That's how it's settled. So what they done, they took a six house farm and split it up into three two house farms. That farmer finished first, second, and third. They got all the money. That's the tournament system. for you. And it, it's just one thing after the other. I have tried. It took me a year to meet with my live uh, live production managers, boss. And and the reason I was meeting with him is she uh, she assigned a flock advisor out there to me. They call them flock advisors now. They used to be flock supervisors until Craig uh, kind of got into it and said that we couldn't be working for them. And that, that's why they changed the name, and that's the way to do things. But... Uh, this fella, he had been going around, uh, that they assigned to me, had been going around telling people that they didn't, the farmers didn't need to be talking to Rudy. Even the live production manager, he's went out there and told farmers, you don't need to be talking to Rudy, he's just looking for an ally. And so that's kind of the mess you got going on. But I've tried to meet with the people in the feed mill. I've tried, you know, they, they won't let you meet with them, or they won't meet with me. Now, I know another farmer down there, he's tried to meet with... Uh, uh, same guy I met with uh, uh, about three months ago, and, and he still ain't gonna meet. But they 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 won't talk to us. They act like they're better than we are. And all I want is an honest day's living. And I mean that's what I've done for 26 years almost. Uh, I worked with Dupont for 32 years. Dupont taught me everything they wanted me to know to help that business. I appreciated what DuPont done for me. Uh, they taught me air conditioned work. They taught that I was certified shoulder right right on down the line. These people don't even train their own people. Because they send somebody out there, which I've been growing chicken for twenty six years, they send somebody that just got out of college out there, they're my boss now. And they come out there with an arrogant attitude. Uh, this fellow I met with her uh live production or live operations manager and he's down in Perry, Georgia. Uh, the one that left me the uh, voicemail, he was from up around Candor. After he left that voicemail and I played for a couple of people, uh, he's moved on. So now they moved the live operations manager down to Perry, Georgia and he's over Perry, Georgia and Jim. So, you know, we can't talk to anybody. Jim Purdue, he'll get on YouTube or wherever and start talking about how he lets his employees, you know, go to HR and all this. Where's my HR? I understand what HR is. I mean, them people are supposed to listen to you and talk up for you. We don't have nobody to talk up for us. They don't want us to even meet together. I mean, you know, and the farmers out there, they, they, they intimidate us. And this manager, when I was talking to him, I, 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 I realized after I talked to him, I made a mistake because I told him that the live uh, production operator, uh, operator manager down there, she intimidated people out there. And that was a mistake because that's what they want. They want people to intimidate these farmers. They, they just ain't going to intimidate me. Rudy. I've, had truck drivers, I've had truck drivers come in there and put the feed in the wrong bin. I go down there and call his hand on him. He, the ticket even said it's supposed to be in the empty bin. He puts it in the other bin. Most farmers out here want the feed because it's the last feed to feed the birds put in this bin. I said, look here. I says, I do think I'm not most farmers. I do things a certain way and that's the way I want to do it. If you can't read, don't come back out here. After he said that, he says, uh, now you can't take pictures of it, can you? Because that's the only way I could tell how much feed was in there. Because when it comes from the feed mill, you got two bins out there, the same thing. You got two trucks and you put half of it on one side and half of it on the other side. And I've taken pictures of it and caught them red handed. But there's nothing done about it. Rudy, uh, a few of the things you've said yeah. Remind me of some of the questions that we're getting from the audience. Tyler, you had mentioned, um, I think it was maybe a, a Rudy example of yeah. um, uh, being, some farmers being required to cull healthy chicks uh, while others were not, and that was an example of an undue preference, for instance. And uh, one of the questions from the audience is, what's the rationale behind the corporation telling a farmer to kill a healthy chicken or lose their contract? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer that succinctly. And, you know, um, so there's very specific um, 
dimensions for birds that run through the processing facility. And if they're below that, then it can cause a lot of problems with needing to slow the line down and essentially lost profits. And so it's easier to cull the healthy chicken because what's going to end up happening is that if Rudy's the one who has to cull the chicken versus, you know, one that you, a different farm or something like that, he's going to end up losing money. So because of the tournament system, the average price per pound cost for feed, medications, and payment to the grower averages out to be the same for every single chicken that's raised within that week. And usually it – I can show you a spreadsheet, but it works out to like – a tenth of a penny that it averages out. You can just follow it along for an entire year and it's less than, you know, a tenth of a penny difference from one bird to another by paper pound. But the reason they do that is so that that line speed doesn't have to slow down. It can keep moving as quickly as possible. And also because some of their customers have very specific um, demands for what they'd like, a particular weight on a breast, a particular weight on a leg, something like that. And if the chicken is not going to meet those specifications, because they can already tell 20 some odd days into a 35 day growth cycle that it's not going to make that. So it's easier to call it out because then Rudy has to pay the cost for disposal of that carcass and the liability for it, as opposed to paying someone that they employ that's a W-2 wage earner on their payroll to do that. So Rudy, none of these growers earn a minimum wage. There's no like set amount that they earn. What they earn is that their check goes to their lender first. Their assignment check, which is essentially their mortgage, comes out. They get what is left over after that. And then they have to pay their suppliers. They have to pay for their cost of living. And whatever else is left, that's what they earn. So after they make payments on their equipment, to their propane dealers, and everything else to keep this you know, farm running, to keep everything continuing, that's what they have to live off of. And so... Steve and myself have heard for years stories of farmers who their lunch is saltine crackers because that's what they have to purchase. And they didn't have a breakfast. There are issues with farmers because they don't have access to health care and because they don't have access to any type of uh, benefits that a normal W-2 wage earner is. They have to choose between paying their wife's prenatal uh, bills or paying a chicken house electric bill. Because if they can't keep the lights on in the chicken house, they're going to lose their house and they're going to lose their farm. And there's some great organizations that have put together maps of where these facilities are. If you look at the maps of where these facilities are, they're in economically depressed counties. They're in counties that don't have many other opportunities that you or I might have living in a larger metropolis. So when people talk about, well, why don't you just farm something else or why don't you find another job, their options are really work at the Dollar General because that's the largest growing grocery chain where they live, or you can work at the Walmart that's an hour and a half drive away. That's what they have. There's not a lot of other opportunities. And so for people that are looking to bring their, their children back to the farm, and they can't make it on corn prices, and they can't make it on soybean prices, because of some of the conditions that a lot of these panels have, uh, panelists have talked about before on previous panels, due to international trade agreements allowing for the production of grain to fall to such a level that farmers can't pay for their cost of production, they turn to this. And it's all a large cycle by these very large corporations to produce grain cheaply enough to sell to consumers at a price and to push more farmers to get into this type of farming. So, sorry, I went a bit off. So, one of the questions that's coming up here that I often hear is with, with this level of control by the companies, um, how is it the growers are not considered employees of the companies? And they, one thing that I have often heard from growers is they get into this because they want to be independent business people. Uh, so it's, it's often a shock, I think, when they find out how little independence they have under this model. And once you're in it, it's tough to extract yourself from that. But I've just opened it to anyone on this question. Would it be better to be an actual employee? Got benefit. They call us contractors. And they more or less hijacked the family farm name. They just came out there and put a plaque on my thing, been established since 1994, Purdue Family Farmer. Well, as far as Purdue's concerned, I'm a contractor. I get no benefits whatsoever 
what I earn, I earn them all. And I have to do other stuff on the side, which I'm retired from DuPont, and my wife's retired from General Motors. So, you know, we can make it. But I, I just feel bad for these kids that's coming up this day and time. When, when my houses, when, when we done them, we done it done a commercial loan. Now, banks are getting backed by our federal government, the FSAs, SA, uh, SBAs, and all this junk. If weren't for that, they wouldn't get it. And it, it, it needs to stop sometime. They don't do nothing but put a moratorium on chicken houses. I mean, they're just, they, they're just running rapid. And I know y'all was talking about going to the, the plant-based stuff. Well, who do you think is going to be running that? Jim Perdue, Tyson, all them. They're going to be, they're going, they, they already going into it. So, you know, what are they building all these other chicken houses out here for? If they're going to go to that. I mean, you know, we got to slow down and do something. To, you, know, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I know communication is a big answer and education on top of that. Uh, we don't make enough of money to hire somebody to run our, our farms. To, to, I mean, you know, a lot of these farmers out here, they're big corn farmers, soybean farmers, and they'll put six, eight, 12, 18 houses out there, and then they'll get somebody to manage them for them, and they, nobody knows how to grow the chickens. OJT, on-the-job training, is the best way to learn how to do this. And that's my take on it. One, um, one of the problems, and I mentioned it's hard to extract yourself from the system once you've started, uh, one of the issues is that the, the chicken houses that you're required to build on your own property for purposes of these contracts are generally just sole purpose um, houses. They're, it's been hard for growers to find other uses for those. And uh, I, w I wanted to ask Mike to talk a little bit about, you know, is there a life after growing? And that's the cue for Mike's uh, pictures to come up. Um, <laughs> Mike, can you talk about your experience in, in getting out of poultry and, and what you're doing now? Sure. But I'm, if you all don't mind, I'm going to have to get up here so I can see the pictures. I'm not sure what's up there. <laughs> Some people mention it's hard to hear, so use the microphone. Uh, can you hear it? Yeah. Okay. Hear me okay? Uh, I was uh, in January, January 8th, uh, my last block of chickens went out of my farm. And... Uh, of course, a lot of people have asked me about that, and uh, when they ask me if I miss those chickens, I tell them, yeah, I miss them like a toothache. <laughs> and that's the truth, believe me. So, uh, I'm a CBD user. I've been using uh, CBD from hemp for almost two years now. Uh, I believe in it. I know it works. <clears throat> so, I got to thinking about maybe I'll just convert my farm over to, to uh, growing industrial hemp and processing, and that's what I'm doing. Um, I started tearing out my equipment and cleaning up my houses and getting them ready to convert to industrial hemp in, in January. Uh, shortly after the, that last flock of chickens went out, and I can show you some examples here of uh, some of the things I've done. That, in addition to raising them inside the houses, I raised them outside too, some, some outside, most of them are, are inside. Th this is an example of one of my outside plants. That's a, That's the the top of the plant itself, they call them the colas, the, the very top of it. And I think maybe there's another picture later on that shows you what they look like after they got big and they got trimmed. Do what? At this thing? There we go. All right, it's working now. Got it. Uh, this is some more of them that, are, that were planted outside. I planted them in, I made beds like they do for tobacco. If you've ever seen that growing, I planted them in beds like this. Uh, these are my poultry, or one of my, this is one of my poultry houses. I have two, they're 50 feet wide and 624 feet long. When I was raising chickens, I had 90,000 chickens per flock in those two houses. This is, um, I, I built some custom-made racks that, 
uh, to start the plants in these little trays right here. Um, what you see right there is a, about a thousand hemp plants. Uh, when I build them, I, I uh, put them on wheels so I could roll them outside on pretty days to give them natural sunlight outside instead of raising them under, under lights. Uh, this is what they look like down in the house after they've been transplanted into bigger pots. Um, normally this, this would have been uh, full of chickens right here, but uh, uh, each section, the one on the left and the one on the right, is, is a thousand hemp plants. Uh, this is a little bit of a close-up of what they look like in the pots. This, this is a little more progression. Unfortunately, I didn't have any more pictures of them as they got bigger, but... Um, yeah, let me, I skipped one here. This is my processing equipment I bought. It uses ethanol to take the oil out of the plants. Um, the, the apparatus on the left there uh, is the actual extractor. Uh, what we do is we put it in a nylon bag and, and soak it in alcohol uh, for about 30 minutes to, to let the, permeate, uh, the alcohol permeate the plant. Uh, then, we, then we transfer that fluid into another container and it runs it into this one on the left right here. <coughs> Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a column on the left side. You, you see the, the yellow uh, coil. Those are coils. This, what, those things are just a big steel, really, is what they are, <laughs> uh, because it separates the alcohol from the oil in the plant. The column on the left, the, the oil runs down the column on the left, and the uh, alcohol is recondensed by the, the red coils there, which are cooled, uh, and it falls down into a jug underneath it there, that clear jug, and then I recycle the alcohol. I can, I can recycle about 80% of the alcohol that's used from each extraction. Uh, the equipment in the center there further processes the oil. It takes it from crude oil down to what we call distillate. And then on the right-hand side is a vacuum oven. Uh, from the distillate phase, I reduce it on down to what's called isolate, which is the, the this is that machinery. The, the crude oil is in that jug on the left and the, the uh, distillate is in the one on the right. Um, this, this is an example, the, the one on the right, the distillate is uh, uh, from plants that I bought from another farmer. Uh, this is another shot of it here. The one on the right is plants that I raised myself. Uh, it's much clearer, much nicer oil. It's, it's a better product, just to brag on myself a little bit. <laughs> but this, that's something that I had to learn. I knew nothing about this business. Uh, every, everything that you see here, I've had to learn as I go. And, you know, I guess that goes to show that even an old guy like me can still learn new things, huh? <laughs> uh, this is some of my, when I first started bottling my, well, I'm actually just getting into the process of bottling the, the uh, oil. I'm reconstituting it. Oh, wait, there's, there, there's my granddaughter. How'd she get in there? <laughs> this is Stella. She'll be a year old next month. Oh. Uh, I thought I had a picture of the isolate. Any, anyway, we're reducing it all the way down. <laughs> I'll let you look at you. Probably look better look at Stella. <laughs> Isn't she a cutie? Uh, we're reducing it all the way down to the crystal form because it's 99.9% .9 pure CBD. And then we're reconstituting it into coconut oil. Uh, we're going to do uh, walnut oil, pecan oil, honey. Uh, we're doing uh, dog biscuits with CBD in them. We're, yeah, uh, we're doing uh, lotion. Pardon me. CBD. Uh, well, it's the question is, what does CBD do? If you're not familiar with it, it uh, the best theories I've, I've read on it say that uh, it everybody has um, cannabinoids that occur naturally in your body. And CBD is one of them, and um, they think it uh, opens up your neural transmitting system, your nervous system around your body and allows your neural transmitters to, to move the way they should. And they've pretty much proven that uh, that's related to inflammation in the joints and everything like that. Uh, and once, that, once your, your neurotransmitters are working the way they're supposed to, it helps relieve that inflammation in your joints. Uh, it takes away pain, you know, it allows your nervous system to eliminate pain in different ways. Uh, I have a friend who has glaucoma really bad who's taken it. He, he went through all kinds of drugs, it just kept getting worse, and he's taking CBD now and it's going away. 
I, I've, I've been a CBD user for almost two years. I have neuropathy really bad in my feet and legs. I've been through all kinds of drugs, physical therapy, everything that anybody knew. Uh, doctor said your choices are take these drugs and or, or live with it, and I don't take things that make me feel funny or make me dizzy. I just don't. I just put up with it, which is what I was doing. So I started researching CBD, and I thought, you know, I'll give it a shot. I, I ordered some from Colorado. It's very expensive. It costs $150 an ounce. Uh, but I started using it, and with three weeks, I started feeling the effects. And uh, now it's, it was all the way up to right here on my legs, like, like you drew a line right straight across here, right above my knees. Uh, now it's all the way back down to my toes, and it's almost gone. Uh, so I'm a living testament to the fact that CBD works. <laughs> Mike, the, we've gotten a number of questions here that I think you're in a good position to answer, given what you've just explained to us. Um, and Rudy touched on this a little bit, too. Um, so one question, and I'll just, they're all related, is to what extent do consumer choices to become vegan or vegetarian negatively impact farmers, and what do we do about that paradox? That was one of the questions. Another one is, and you may have just answered this, is transitioning to a plant-based agriculture like, for instance, peas for alternative meats, a viable option for contract growers to transition to and escape the system. And then another question about how do we uh, make sure, and this is what t Rudy touched on, that in moving into these new markets for hemp in your example and others, uh, how do we make sure that it just doesn't kind of replicate the poultry model and then it ends up being fully contracted and controlled by some of the same players? Well, to answer the last question first, uh, it's, uh, an attempt is already being made to, to corner the CBD market and the medical cannabis market. Um, it's, it's mostly by big pharma, number one. Big oil is getting into it and big tobacco. Or, uh, I'm convinced that they're behind a scheme to, to uh, push FDA into creating onerous uh, requirements on, on uh, hemp farmers uh, and processors like me um, that, that they can't meet. Uh, just terribly expensive things that, that force us into doing those and they know we won't be able to afford it to push us out so that big pharma and big oil and big tobacco can take those things over. And, and I believe too that they're doing that with medical cannabis. Uh, especially big pharma. Uh, they, they've seen the, the medical benefits of it and they know that the, the revenue is going to be there in the future once it, it gets developed the way it should be. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're doing that today. Or some of the other things. Oh, uh, transitioning for, you know, for, for a poultry farmer like me to transition to something like this, this is terribly expensive. That equipment I showed you cost $160,000 just for the extraction equipment. And it's on the low end. Uh, you can spend a half a million dollars on that equipment very easily if you wanted to do it. So, you know, when you're, when you're a poultry farmer, you're just paying your bills, and you're, most of them are lucky if they can feed their kids along with paying their bills. Uh, it's hard to do something like that. Um, I was lucky that uh, I'm a retired federal agent. I, I, worked, I, I, I was a state wildlife officer in West Virginia, and then I was a special agent for U.S. Fish and Wildlife for 20 years. I retired from that. And because of that outside income, I didn't have to rely on my chicken check, we called them, to live and to feed my kids. And that's, that's one of the things that gave me the opportunity to be the president of Contract Poultry Growers Association and constantly give the poultry companies hell because I didn't have to rely on that chicken check. And that drove them crazy, let me tell you. They, they didn't know what to do about that. They didn't know how to handle me. And, I, and I'm, I'm amazed that they didn't terminate me a long time ago, but they, they didn't know how. They were scared because of those things, that, you know, what I do in my background. Uh, and what were the other questions? Conversion and... Is, is uh, uh, moving toward a vegan vegetarian diet helping or hurting the farmers for consumers to do that? And well, I think Rudy or somebody mentioned earlier that uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure how much it's going to help farmers because uh, this Impossible Burger that, that Burger King came out with, uh, Big Ag has already taken that over. They're seeing, the, somebody mentioned earlier, Tyson, I think it was really that Tyson's getting into that already. So is JBS, who owns Pilgrim's Pride. Um, and I think their intentions are to take that over, too. 
So I don't, I don't know how much it's going to help the farmers. I, I hope it does. You know, same way with, with uh, industrial hemp. Uh, it was legalized and a whole bunch of farmers got into it. Uh, this year was the, the most production there's been. Uh, there was overproduction terribly. And a lot, of, a lot of the hemp farmers are going to get stuck with their crop. I don't know what they're going to do with it. One of the reasons is there's not enough uh, processing available out there. Um, we had to pay a dollar a piece for our hemp seeds here to plant them. Uh, I just got a, because I have a state license, it's, it's public knowledge and anybody can access it that wants to. And <clears throat> I get emails fairly regularly from different companies that want to do something with hemp. I got one last week from a company in Michigan that had contracted with a bunch of farmers up there to raise it for them so that they could resell it and, and assume, uh, I assume they intended to make a profit on it. But uh, they had so much and they couldn't get rid of it, they were offering it for sale for $1.47 a pound. What, what I bought from another farmer in West Virginia, I paid $27 a pound for it. So that tells me there's a tremendous surplus of it out there this year, and I'm not sure what the farmer's going to do with it. I've already accepted uh, processing from four other farmers besides myself to, try to help them out, you know, so that they don't lose their shirt on that. But I don't know what the rest of them out there are going to do. Mike, I, I want to read just a few more comments that are coming in from the audience because um, we're going to have to wrap up real quickly here. But just hearing some frustrations from f some folks about lack of... Uh, information about this model out there, both from the consumer standpoint and potential farmers. Um, one comment is, uh, I work in academia and I'm surrounded by people who are well known for their work for human and labor rights, but they refuse to acknowledge the fact that they are complicit in the problem by buying food that are from products in this abusive cycle. I argue with them all the time. They won't, uh, they don't want to get Get, they don't want to get it because it involves having to make changes in their personal lives. They find them selfish for refusing to acknowledge and corrupt labor practices. Uh, I invited many of them to come here today, and none of them showed. Um, what should we say to them? And then a, a similar vein is a common, are there opportunities to educate potential contract growers about the exploitative nature of the system and to offer... Uh, them other opportunities before they sign up. And um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that, you know, back in 2002 Farm Bill, it's hard to believe this, but we actually had to put uh, legislation into the Farm Bill to allow contract growers to share their contracts with their families, their accountants, their bankers, with federal officials. Um, the confidentiality clauses were just one example of where the poultry companies have really tried to make sure that, that the, the word does not get out about this model. And so a number of years ago, we did uh, make a decision that we needed to start talking to folks in a much uh, broader way through the media as opposed to one-on-one -on -one conversations. And that led to kind of an expose piece that John Oliver did that many of you all may have seen in 2015 where he took a lot of the things that we're talking about in, in, in his way in you know, 15, 20 minutes made it very entertaining and uh, I think it's gotten uh, close to two million hits. So that actually, more so than any of the things we've been doing on the Hill, I saw some significant changes where members of Congress who had been blocking the Obama administration's proposed rules on this stuff backed off and said, ooh, we don't want to be called out by John Oliver because he was calling them out by name. So, I mean, that's one way to both speak to uh, the consumer side but also to potential growers. Um, and I, I know we, we do have to, to wrap up. Any last words from the rest of you all before we... Turn the mics back over. Let me shamefully promote my CBD products here. First. <laughs> Here's my logo. Our, our website will be active next week. <laughs>